This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Appreciate you joining us here on Real Talk. We've got a great show in store coming up in about a half an hour. We're going to check in with two storytellers in the context of Black History Month. Looking forward to connecting with Nazan and Knight and Jesse Lipscomb. Plus, of course, in about an hour from now, we're going to get to your email sent in to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Trash talk. You are all fired up today. And we're going to be talking about health care. We're going to be talking about orphan wells and environmental cleanup. We're going to be talking about handshakes. And we're going to be talking oh, about issues that are either sexy or not. I described a political issue yesterday as not sexy. And that lit a fire under Larry, who sent us a legendary email. He's going to, he's going to hit lead off on Trash Talk today. But, but we open with talk of the provincial and federal politics. Uh, Eric Denhoff, uh, for a long time, worked in the space. Now, you know, there's, there's folks that get all the camera time, right? The elected officials, the politicians, the MLAs, the MPs, the ministers, the first ministers, the premiers, and then the prime minister. But anybody that knows politics will tell you it's oftentimes the deputy ministers that are making things happen. Eric served as a deputy minister in both Alberta and British Columbia governments, as well as a chief federal negotiator. He's also worked in the private sector for about half of his career. And and if you ask anybody who knows him, the guy knows his stuff. It's great to have him returning to Real Talk. It's nice to see your face again. Happy Friday. Good morning. Hey, where are you sitting right now? That's that's about the best background that we've ever seen. Is that's like bone china and fine artifacts? My, are these collected I'm from all around the world? Room. I'm in my dining room. It's the only room safe from the dogs. <laughs> okay, there. What kind of dogs do you have? You can learn a lot about a person. Three, I got three dogs. I got a Sheltie, a Springer Spaniel, and a Rescue. That's I think half uh, Border Collie and half Lab, probably something like that. And who calls the shots out of the three of them? Uh, the Sheltie, yeah. He's the, the oldest. Okay, there you go. Seniority, I love it. Well, Eric, it's good to see your face again. There's sometimes, uh, mm-hmm. a, 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 am I on to something when I when I characterize the role that deputy ministers play in actually making things happen in the political world? Yeah, I mean, the job of the bureaucracy is to implement the will of the government, whoever the will of the government might be, whether it's conservative or liberal or NDP or social credit or you know whoever's in charge. So the idea is that the bureaucracy is a neutral, technical implementer of the government's policies and uh you know the ministers have a terrific amount of responsibility running around and you know doing their politicking and cutting ribbons and giving speeches and and developing that policy in the first place so they can't they can't physically implement everything so You've seen it all. Uh, if not that, yeah. you've seen a lot of it. Uh, let's get to some of the news of the day. I've been, I've been looking forward to asking you what you made of the handshake, that moment, uh, Alberta Premier Daniel Smith's first meeting in person with the Prime Minister, with Justin Trudeau. I know that they've spoken on the phone uh, before that. Trudeau reaches in for the handshake. Everybody's seen it. She begrudgingly offers up her hand. What It results in an awkward photo op. You think it was intentional on behalf of the Premier? Yeah, I, I think it was a kind of muffled attempt at a strategy. You know, uh, it was sort of, ooh, Justin, you know, school kid <laughs> type stuff. It, it's funny. In Alberta, it means so much more than any other jurisdiction. You know, no, nobody else in the country, including Quebec, says whatever you do when you go to Ottawa, don't shake the prime minister's hand. And Quebec has arguably as much or more uh, contentious uh, relationship with Ottawa than than anybody. But you know, personally, I think it was immature and you know didn't really serve a purpose. But if you pick up the paper in Calgary the day after. Uh, people seem to like it. You know, uh, a certain portion of the population of, of Alberta and a certain portion of the population everywhere of people who don't like Trudeau sort of viscerally have a deep and abiding dislike of him, uh, probably liked it. I, I just thought it came across as sort of um, a half-hearted attempt at a snub and a not very well done one. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens in the future. I, I I like to think that she sat around with her her team, you know, in advance of the Ottawa trip. But this shows kind of how immature our country is. What are you going to do if he offers to shake your hand? I mean, what, what, where does this happen? I mean, if you notice the Ukrainians meeting the Russians after the invasion, the Ukrainian delegation still shook the Russians' hands. I mean, that's how petty this was. So I, I don't know. It's uh, time will tell, I guess. But uh, it seemed to me 
unnecessary. But as I say, you know, the next day in the Calgary paper, uh, it was treated as if uh, yay for Danielle for snubbing uh, the prime minister. So, yeah, yeah. I, I wonder if there's a divide between Calgary and Edmonton, how it plays even. I mean, yeah, maybe I, you know, a bit. You know, Calgary's always said, you know, back to Pierre Trudeau and Red Square, uh, you know, days. Calgary's already always had a bit more a- animosity towards uh, a liberal prime minister and particularly the Trudeau. So, yeah, hard to say. Do you think the rest of the country pays attention to stuff like this? Like, do you think, you know, I had some of, you know, people in my sphere, people that I follow on social media, some were cheering it, uh, some were ambivalent, and then some felt like it was an embarrassment. It was an embarrassing day for Alberta, was it? Yeah, I think I think in a different context it was for her strategy. I don't think most of the rest of the country pays much attention to it, no, and uh, certainly after a day or so, not at all. What I thought was intriguing was she'd taken all this time, the Premier, to write a big you know, public letter to Trudeau demanding that he meet with her, time to sort out these big national issues together. She wanted him to come to Alberta and sit down and meet with her as the new premier. And she was going to use that to great political theater effect to, you know, dress down the prime minister in Alberta in front of Albertans and show him just how tough she was. Trudeau very cleverly said, well, you know, you're coming to Ottawa. Let's do the meeting on the sidelines here. Meeting happened. She had, you know, 15 minutes or whatever with him to tell her story of woe. And he said, yeah, I agree with you on most of that stuff. Came out to the camera, smiled and nodded. And she got Zippo out of it. The whole rest of the country didn't even know the meeting had happened. It was totally overshadowed by the uh, health ministers uh, and and prime minister meeting. And she lost this big opportunity from her her letter to uh, sort of upbraid uh, Trudeau before Alberta. So that's what I thought actually the bigger news was coming out of it than the handshake. Yeah. Uh, What are you expecting to see? Uh, Obviously, you know, at the end of May, Albertans are expected uh, to be going to the polls. Uh, Crazier things have happened, but we are assuming that there's going to be a provincial election at the end of May. The premier says that she'll adhere to that date. Uh, What do you expect to see relationship wise between Alberta and Ottawa? I would imagine that the politicking that will ensue, um, you know, as it suggested, Danielle Smith may be campaigning against Justin Trudeau at the same time she's campaigning against Rachel Notley. How do you think that'll play out? Yeah, I think I think that that's exactly what will happen. She, you know, every Alberta premier, most Western premiers campaign against Ottawa. It doesn't matter their political stripe, whether they're uh, NDP or liberal or conservative, they tend to campaign a bit against Ottawa. So I expect she'll do that. She's in a little bit of a, uh, not a box, but she has some constraints in that she's still trying to get some big concessions out of Ottawa on more CCUS funding to aid the oil industry and, you know, a couple of other asks out of Ottawa. So on the one hand, she'll have her officials still trying to drag down some money and she'll claim credit for anything she can get between now and the election. On the other hand, absolutely, she'll she'll keep uh, bashing Ottawa, not not as um, antagonistically as she did during the leadership campaign, but it'll, a swipe will still be a part of every campaign speech, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, Eric, a big part of this, and, and you know, a lot of people I know want to see Alberta's premier square off against the prime minister on the just transition. We've spent a lot of time talking about that, but a big part of, of this, a big part of the focus this week across the country was on health care funding. Uh, yeah. The premier's looking to Ottawa for, for $28 billion a year in increased funding. Instead, uh, they get a total of uh, just over $46 billion over the next 10 years. Uh, how bad is health care right now from a guy that's been on the un- inside and that has seen how the machine operates? What's your assessment? Yeah, so I've spent half my career in the public service and half in the private sector. And I actually started in the public service in, in a health ministry uh, in B.C. years ago. And, you know, 30 years ago, people were saying, here's the demographics on Canada. You know, we're going to be aging. We're going to, our healthcare costs are going to keep going up and up. We're going to need more doctors. People are retiring fast, uh, you know, in the coming years. Uh, we don't have enough people. And politicians in every province and at the federal level basically ignored this stuff. I mean, they're all responsible. It doesn't matter what party. They've all been in power over the last 30 years, basically. Um, and and they did not take the time and effort to expand the medical schools, expand the nursing schools, all out of this sort of bravado that everything would be fine. And, you know, healthcare in Canada, unfortunately, it's administered by people with a two-week uh, vision cycle, politicians, uh, and they don't get anything out of building a big new medical school that isn't going to be constructed for 10 years and, and produce its first crop. So they try to do, you know, band-aid things year after year, and it just kept putting things off and putting them off. And now, 
we're in a, an unbelievable crisis. I mean, imagine for uh, you know Canadians of your age and my age. Uh, I'm, I'm a couple of years older. Maybe a couple. No, nobody ever would have imagined somebody saying, you know, a million people in BC don't have a doctor. One in five people in Alberta don't have a family doctor. That, people would have just said, "Well, you're crazy. That'll never happen." But the but the healthcare economists and the healthcare demographic people. They knew it was coming and they knew the retirement levels that were happening and also that the number of people my age were going to start absorbing more and more health dollars and services. And we did not plan and execute even remotely. So I'm not an ideologue about private and public sector. I firmly believe in the public sector ability to de deliver public health care. But I'm like most Canadians. Look, if you can't give me public health care and you need to mix in a bit of private, I would probably say, OK, I, I don't think we've done a good job proving the public sector can't deliver it because we've just kept punting and punting and punting. And so my worry is if you go and have uh, like Premier Smith wants to do and Ford wants to do and say, we're gonna open up a private sector, that doesn't graduate a single more doctor. It doesn't graduate a single more surgeon. So there's no more people, no more nurses suddenly able to deliver those services through a private system than there are in the public system. What it'll do is it'll mean that people who have money get to the front of the line. So I'm really worried about that. And, I, and I'm really, really ashamed of Canada's political class for ignoring this problem to the point where the thing Canadians always identified number one as being Canadian, you know, with the flag, Medicare is in so much danger. It's just terrible. Did you see John Iveson's column in the in the National Post? He, uh, it's just out uh, a few days ago. He says premiers should take Ottawa's health care money and run to private delivery. He points out yeah. the fact that polling shows that almost 60 percent of Canadians are OK with at least the assertion that we should attempt uh, new approaches that could include private delivery. Uh, I asked Rachel Notley about it yesterday. She's got zero appetite for it. I think we're going to speak to the yeah. premier next week. I think she'd be open to it. And I wonder if the majority of Canadians might be as well. Well, look, right now, I mean, if you're sitting in a, in a, in a town in rural Alberta where you your emergency room's closed and the hospital can't get surgeons and you haven't been able to find a family doctor for three years, if I said to you, would you be okay with aliens or Cubans running our healthcare system if it meant you could get a doctor tomorrow? 80% of Canadians would stick their hand up. So when when you say to people, you know, are you in favor of a private sector solution? They think that that means it's a solution. They, they, it doesn't compute to them that it doesn't add a single doctor. And, and I'll give you an example of, you know, I don't want to be ideological because we, we see a mixed system in part in Canada already. You know, physiotherapists are private and doctors are, in fact, private. They're publicly paid private, you know, uh, private individuals. And x-rays in some provinces and MRIs are private and others are public. And that's really. Thing. But if you take a look at the difference between Alberta and B.C. on this question around surgeries. So in B.C., they're pr pretty ideological. And the health minister said, well, if we need more surgeries, I want to catch up. So I'm going to open up operating rooms. Instead of closing them at four in the afternoon, we're going to keep them running, you know, through the night. We're going to do way more surgeries. We're going to hire more anesthesiologists. We're going to get more surgeons in. We're going to hire more nurses. And he ran MRIs 24 hours a day. So you could go at two o'clock in the morning and get your MRI. In Alberta, the province refuses to expand generally those services, although they have reached out and started to do some surgeries in smaller centers uh, of unused surgery time. And instead, they want to go create private clinics uh, to do surgeries. And I, it, it's complicated because on the one hand, if you say, okay, let's take orthopedic surgeries. They only get a few hours a day in a hospital because they have to divide up the surgery space with all the other specialties. Let's have a place where all they do is orthopedic surgeries. It's a separate standalone building. You don't have to come in and risk getting COVID in the big hospital or other disease or whatever. And we could just chingity ching, put people through giggity gig, you know, like a factory on orthopedics. And we should be able to pump up more volume and be more efficient. Yes, in theory, you should, but you could also just set up that building with the public system and pay the orthopedes uh, through the, that system and produce the same volume. So mm. until we see some actual factual analysis that that private model will produce more surgeries, I'm suspicious of it. And I'm suspicious because I know what happens when you open it up. We see it in the UK. Wealthy people get to the front of the line. That's what happens. It's a mixed yeah. system and, and it just happens. Yeah. yeah so. the, uh, the jerk, the realist... <laughs> Might also point out that that's kind of how life works everywhere else. Yeah, it is. It doesn't really fly to talk about healthcare in that way, but that's how the rest well, of life was, works. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You know, we've, we we had since since the days of Medicare, we had that fight, and Canadians seem to subscribe collectively to this idea that became embedded in our bones that everybody had equal access. Now, mm -hmm. 
over the years, you and I know this, especially if you lived in Calgary, that was a myth. You would just fly down to Scottsdale and, and get the thing done down there and you'd pay five grand. And if you were a guy in the oil industry, you know, paying five grand or 20 grand for knee surgery or whatever, it wasn't that big a deal. No, you'd if spend five a, grand in champagne on the flight down. Yeah, probably, exactly. So it, it kind of depends. And also we do, as I say, we have a bit of a mixed system. You know, in British Columbia with an NDP government, they spend millions every year on private surgeries because they simply couldn't, even with expanding the public system as much as they could, they didn't have the capacity. And there was this existing private system that they inherited uh, in place. And so they said, well, for the short term, anyway, let's use it. Mm. So, you know, a good friend of mine, it's it's interesting you bring up orthopedic surgeries. A good friend yeah. of mine is an orthopedic surgeon. I've promised him because he gives me the inside scoop. I've promised him that I'll never yeah. use his name. And he has, tur- <laughs> he has turned down every request to come on the show, uh, you know, for, for fear of professional implications. But one exactly. of the, one, one of the yeah. points that he's made to me uh, and, and he is uh, he is an ardent uh, defender of public health care right. and yeah. uh, and he's a, a very successful physician uh, a practitioner but but he told me one of the things that he's concerned about is that surgeries that we would be conducted in, in private facilities if there was and he said it's very likely there would yeah. be follow-up required uh, if yeah. there was any need for for that uh, patient to revisit to have the surgery you know yeah. heaven forbid redone but you know oftentimes yeah. they've got to go exactly. back in exactly. yeah. he goes this yeah. is going to fall back onto the public again he goes and that's something that not many people are talking about i appreciated no, that angle from him no. and alberta you know people forget alberta did experience that there was a private hospital under the conservatives in alberta that went bankrupt and the government had to bail it out so mm-hmm. you know it's not a it's not a guarantee that just setting up something private automatically works as i say i have to be careful because you know i, I grew up in an era of medicare and you know i grew up in the prairies where it was sort of sacrosanct and i don't want to be ideological about it if i genuinely thought that private adding up more of the private mix into the system would in fact make a big difference for regular working class people. You know, if if Harry and Mabel actually could get their orthopedic surgery in 60 days instead of a year, uh, I think we'd all be crazy not to look at something. I'm just not convinced it would be Harry and Mabel getting it. I think it'd be uh, Alex Purbe from Sonova so would be getting it, you know. Mm. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. I, I, I've always thought, and, and maybe I have a, I don't know, maybe, maybe, and and this is why I appreciate you is like your experiences, especially as a deputy minister, and you you understand kind of how these how these things need to play out. You and your offices and your roles were tasked with actually making things happen. Uh, But I've always thought that that if you have people, and I I don't prefer to call it skipping the line or jumping the queue, but I guess call a spade a spade if that is what it is. If people did have an option for private surgeries, number one, I think you could tax them heavily. You know, the idea that one private surgery might pay for that private surgery and a public surgery. and you're freeing up a spot in the, in the on the wait list. Um, now, I know people will say as well, well, you're going to get all the skilled professionals or all the talented surgeons, you know, to go yeah. to the private facilities to chase the dollars, whatever that yeah. case may be. There's a lot of things to think about. But to me, it does appear on the surface. If you keep an open mind and some of my friends can't stand when I talk about it, yeah. they can't yeah. stand that I'm open minded to the idea. Yeah. But it seems to me to be obvious that the more surgeons you have, the more options you have, the shorter the wait list. But maybe I'm missing something. Yeah, and I think the problem is where did those surgeons come from that that actually open somebody up on the wait list for? So if you have 100 surgeons, 100 orthopedes in Alberta, and 10 of them go over to the private sector, their wait lists that they had in the public sector are now on the on the list of the 90 people over there, and they move over, and they take so many off that list of 100. But, you know, are they just taking the same 10 they had off the 100 with them and doing them faster? Or are they taking 20, leaving more more spots for uh, for uh, the, or leaving fewer spots for the, the remaining doctors? It depends how it's constructed. And what would be interesting to see is, you know, a really good debate between people who have evidence to compare the private mixed systems and the and the non-private. We know in Saskatchewan that when Scott Moe and the folks decided to run way more private MRIs, it didn't shorten the wait list at all. It it ended up after a couple of three years basically being where they were all the time. So I I think let's do an experiment, you know, on, on one of the key areas of it and give it a try and see what happens instead of just having an ideological battle. We're yeah. not gonna well, nobody's gonna do that before an election, but We'll yeah. see what happens after an election. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. I mean, isn't it interesting, right? Because these bold visions and big promises can win an yeah. election, but it, but if yeah. they but if they stir things up enough and, and create nervousness fear. and, it, yeah. and yeah, exactly. create fear, then it could blow yeah. up in a politician's face quite the obviously. The new money isn't very much money. I mean, the new money for Alberta probably means the 5% that we're going to get anywhere annual lift on their budget from Ottawa for health care, plus about 
I don't know, 500 million a year more or something, you know, cash. So it's not nothing, but Alberta, Alberta did a funny thing, you know, over the last few years, it used to be that Alberta spent $2,000 for every man, woman, and child a year. So a family of four, Alberta was spending 8,000 a year more than a province like Ontario or BC or Quebec or whatever on, on education and healthcare. So Alberta's services were tremendous. I mean, they were almost American-like, frankly. If you came from another province into Alberta and ended up in a hospital or a doctor's office, you'd be amazed. Like only two years ago in Alberta, you used to get flyers in your condo from doctors advertising that they were looking for patients. In BC, they already had three-year wait lists to find a doctor, a million people without a doctor. Right. So that was the difference. Yeah. If you walked into a hospital in BC, you thought you were in a third world country some days, the floors weren't clean and the staffing levels were so low. You went into an Alberta hospital and you thought you'd arrived in Phoenix. You know, So Albertans didn't see that because they only saw every day their own experience. Now Alberta spends less than the national average on healthcare. That's unbelievable. In just a few short years, they've gone from spending way more than the national average to less per capita, not a lot, but $18 per person less than the national average. If you add 500 million into a 23 and a half, $24 billion health budget, I mean, it'll help a bit, but it's not its not going to make things turn around overnight. Eric, this, know, feel, this feels like an old story, but I'm surprised, that, I'm surprised that more people aren't talking about it. I'm, I'm about to hard swerve here and ask you for an, <laughs> an opinion question. This is a question I'd ask you, you know, over whiskeys or over a coffee. Uh, then finance minister Jason Nixon had the absolute yeah. pleasure, the political privilege of announcing that the government's surplus for the previous year was expected to be $550 million. In, instead, it, it wound up at, at over $13 billion. billion. Yeah. Dollars. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and all of us pundits and everybody that, that loves to chatter about this kind of stuff, imagine how would we spend or invest? What would yeah. we do with the $13 billion? If you were calling the shots, what do you think would have been the smart political move? What would have been the best for the province? Well, in terms of public policy, part of the best for the province was what they did commit to do originally, and now Daniel Smith backed off, which is to put some of it into the Heritage Trust Fund. Mm -hmm. You know, today's oil and gas wealth um, is basically robbing from future generations. You know, and when when I don't care what your belief in the energy transition was, whether you think it's 10 years or 30 years or 50 years or 100, even Harper said he was going to wind up fossil fuel use in this in this century so you know at some point there's no more fossil fuel revenue coming in and it wouldn't wouldn't be a bad idea to have a bit more in the heritage fund the other the other key area is recruitment you know education recruitment so another medical school or an expansion of the medical school rapid expansion much more dramatic than has been done of the nursing school much more rapid expansion of, of health staffing uh, much higher incentives for people to go out to the rural areas and and stay there for years and I don't think that would have used up very much. That would have used up, you know, to do that, 500 million, a billion, something like that. It's not, it wouldn't be that much money. We keep dumping money into the healthcare system in, in uh, capital equipment, new buildings, and in uh, wages, but we're not putting it into recruitment uh, and uh, staffing. And, you know, Kenny was not one of my favorite people. I mean, apparently he wasn't anybody's favorite person because he didn't last very long. But, you know, he did do one brilliant thing. Towards the end of his tenure, he made a deal in the Philippines with a college saying, "You, if you'll follow a curriculum that matches Alberta's regulatory minimum requirements for nursing, we'll hire every nurse you produce. Hmm. So we'll tell you what our curricula is. If you follow it, then when they come here, we'll give them really fast accreditation into Alberta. What a smart move. You have a whole cadre of well, well-trained, typically Filipino nurses who are already predisposed to come to Canada. If they follow the Alberta curriculum, more or less, they'll get into Alberta much quicker and you can recruit hundreds of people a year with a very small investment. We need to do more creative things like that. You know, at one point in Saskatchewan, two thirds of all the family doctors were from South Africa. You know, anybody in Edmonton or Calgary or Vancouver has probably seen a South African doctor along the way. Uh, my, when I first went back to Alberta, all of the doctors I saw in, in the uh, three years I was back, every one of them was from uh, overseas. I didn't see a single Canadian-born doctor. I saw one specialist who was Canadian. Every, every everybody else was. So why why are we having such trouble? Australia brought in a uh, thousand doctors to fifteen hundred a year. Australia and New Zealand from the UK for many many years. Why did we suddenly create these barriers to importing doctors uh, if we're having so much trouble training our own? And why did we allow the colleges, the the, the doctors' colleges? Union. It's basically a union who wanted to restrict the number of doctors so that they could keep their wages high. We were insane to allow these things to happen, and now we're going to have to flood the country over the next decade with doctors to try and restore balance. But Canadians in for a really rude surprise. 
you're going to have third world health care in many places in Canada for the next decade while we turn it around. Mm. Because you can't create a medical school overnight. You can't create a new nursing school overnight. You just can't fix these things overnight. And Can it's I, gonna, Canadians are going to be stunned. Is, is this question too simple, like like too simplified? What I mean, like if you ask, yeah. who's, who's – fault is all this because as humans we love to assign blame because then we can focus that we can build our opinions of that is this the fault of the provinces is this the fault of the feds if you talk to either party they're going to tell you the other is to blame what do you think well i think you have to compartmentalize it some of the money fault is clearly the feds they did cut back the uh, money uh, component that went to the provinces from from the original i don't know say 35 40 50 percent to about 20 but the provinces had within their control with the colleges to increase the number of doctors and the number of nurses, and they've had sufficient money to do it. I mean, one of the things that drives the Ottawa politicians and bureaucrats crazy is Alberta complaining about not getting enough health care money when they gave away a billion and a half in tax cuts a year to the oil industry. They're giving away $20 billion in new uh, you know, deal to the oil companies to fix their own oil wells that they're supposed to clean up on their own. And then comes back hat in hand to Ottawa and says, oh, you're impoverishing us on health care funding. Harper actually gave Alberta an extra uh, about half a billion a year when they redid the equalization formula. He, he refused. He, he got into a fight with Ralph Klein over equalization. And Harper, people forget, the great conservative savior of Alberta, refused to revisit the equalization formula. In fact, he, he in favor of Alberta, he gave Quebec more <laughs> under the equalization formula than Pierre Trudeau did. It's unbelievable. And to quiet... Klein down, he gave Klein, I forgot, four or 500 million a year more of health money. So Alberta got a big dollop of new health money under Harper. And they've been, you know, in, in pretty good shape, except for the recession. Financially, they had 13 billion, as you say, last year in surplus. Mm. And they're still pretending like it's, it's Ottawa's fault. Well, mm. in, in a small amount, it is Ottawa's fault. In a large amount, it's been the province's fault. And as I say, I don't blame any particular party. Every party's done some of this is sort of punting it to the future. But also it's Canadians' fault. I mean, we just were sleepwalking through this thing. Everybody just assumed, well, when they heard their neighbors say they were having a tough time getting a doctor, well, I don't care. I've got a doctor. They must have done something wrong because everybody in Canada has a doctor. And it wasn't until they picked up the paper one day and it said, you know, a million people in Alberta or whatever are without a doctor or half a million people. The people went, hey, this is broken. Until their own child was in emergency ward for eight hours waiting to get through, people just genuinely weren't willing to go into the streets, write letters, make calls, and demand more of the healthcare system. And now... The turnaround takes a long time. This isn't something you can fix tomorrow. Before I let you go, uh, I yeah. want to get to this comment. The live chat smoking right now. Everybody's got their take on healthcare. I appreciate that. Karen says, "What a what an episode of Real Talk yesterday." She's talking about our conversation with Reagan Boychuk, uh, Mark Doran. We were talking yeah. about uh, reclamation, remediation, essentially yeah. orphan well cleanup, the liabilities yeah. that are estimated yeah. to be at a minimum two hundred fifty billion dollars, which is a yeah. staggering number. It's, what's the What's the Heritage Savings Trust at like nineteen billion? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Puts it in perspective. Yeah. Karen says we need to amplify the message that if the laws in place were enforced, orphan wells would be cleaned up without a bribe. With our tax dollars, I feel like exactly. I'm almost tossing you up a softball here. But th- this twenty billion dollar plan, this it's R star, it's okay. absolutely insane. It's piracy. I haven't seen piracy like this, you know, since since the uh, ships were in the open seas. You know, here, here the Scotia Bank yesterday afternoon. I mean, the bastion of free enterprise says that this is the opposite of what capitalism is supposed to do. Capitalism, the very nature of it, is supposed to take care of its liabilities. Uh, you know, on the way to making a profit. The Scotia Bank attacked the Alberta government's $20 billion giveaway plan, and they said it could really hurt the industry's reputation. Well, they're darn right it will. It's insane. You know, the, the reality is not only are they legally obliged to clean this stuff up, and most of it, Daniel Smith's trying to spin, well, a lot of this stuff's really, really old, you know. Well, most of it, in fact, is the last 20 years that they're talking about cleaning up. Imperial Oil was there 20 years ago. You know, Shell was there 20 years ago. A lot of these players were there. The reality is it's a giveaway of unparalleled proportions to the industry in Alberta. And one of the tragedies of of Alberta Conservatives is they have just been rolling over every single time like a puppy wanting his tummy scratched to the oil industry. The oil industry doesn't even have to threaten anything anymore. All they have to do is show up at a meeting. The government says, well, what can we give you? You know, it's it's, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen an industry with this level of of control over a bunch of chicken politicians in my life. 20 billion bucks needlessly that that would hire 10,000 nurses for a decade. Right there, you know. How's that and, for a perspective and, and You don't check. need to give it to them. They're already obliged to pay for it. It's totally reckless. Uh, 
this will wrap uh, our conversation here uh, from Shalane. Uh, where did her comment go? And this is just really a shout out to the living beings that you share your home with, Eric. Uh, Shalane says, I have a Sheltie. And yeah. she says, you need to soundproof a room to escape their barking. So whatever you did there, <laughs> my man, whatever you did today, a job very well done. She's right, but I have the only Sheltie that doesn't bark a lot. I don't know what happened, but she's right. Generally, as a breed, they're very yappy. Yeah, you've you've infused some chill into that Sheltie gene. It's nice to see your face again, man. Have a great weekend. You too. Thanks so much. Yeah, you got it. You can follow Eric on Twitter at E. Denhoff. Uh, That's what I do, and then I basically just steal all of his insights, John, and it makes us all feel smarter. So there you go. You can follow him at E. Denhoff, uh, former longtime deputy minister in both Alberta and B.C., a, a chief federal negotiator. And as you can tell, has a real solid command on the issues. I appreciate his insights. Coming up in just a moment, we're going to get to our Real Talk Roundtable that's presented by our friends at Urban Timber. Have you checked out their boxcar collection? This is absolutely amazing. Uh, And by the way, a shout out right now, Darren. You know, Darren and Leanne own the company. Check out their Instagram right now. Darren's on on a mission. Johnny, he's down stateside. He drove his pickup down there with a flat deck. And he's bought one of those old, you know, the Jeep Wagoneers, the like wood paneled Wagoneers. And he's trailering this thing back up to Alberta. And I think that they have a big, bold vision for how that that wood paneled Wagoneer is going to advertise for Urban Timber. I'm super excited to see it. You can follow along on his journey by following them on Instagram. If you go to their website, urbantimber.ca, you can check out exactly what they do. This boxcar collection is stunning. Again, urbantimber.ca. We're talking about wood that's been reclaimed from rail cars, you know, rail car planks that have traveled millions of miles across North America. The, 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 the cargo and the freight being dragged across these boards. And so they've got all these scuffs and scrapes, everything that gives them character. Well, the team at Urban Timber, they reclaim this wood. They clean it up. And, and what results is just absolutely one of a kind furniture. I mean, whether it's games night with the kids or end of the cellar, you know, with a group of friends. Their boxcar tables are ready to take on decades of laughter and stories and and heart-to-hearts. You can go visit them in person. There's nothing like seeing the boxcar collection there. I mean, it could be shelving. They do, obviously, wood flooring, wood paneling on walls, interior, exterior. Nobody does it quite like urban timber. If you're looking to reinvent yourself, if this has been part of maybe your, I don't know, New Year's resolution, it's not too late. As a matter of fact, this weekend, a perfect time to log on to AthabascaU.ca and check out how their world-class accredited online programs and courses could could maybe act as a game changer for you. What are the barriers standing in the way of you heading back to school to achieve that professional certification? Maybe pursue that undergraduate degree. Maybe go for that master's or even doctorate program. At Athabasca U, you design the pace of your studies. You know there's more than 35 master's programs there that you can take a look at. Hey, the world is your oyster. And that journey can all start right now at Athabasca University by checking out their website, AthabascaU.ca. Now, whether it's a Sheltie or a Shepherd, whether it's a Chihuahua or a Chow Chow, if your pup is looking for, I don't know, maybe something different, maybe it's a health issue, maybe they're not intrigued by their food anymore, you've seen it happen, it kind of surprises you a little bit, your pup walks past their kibble and you go, well, that's not like them. Why not explore Grand Dog Essentials Quality Raw Food? They have helped our family figure out the perfect setup for our pups. That's Moses and Monroe. At granddog.ca, they have a February special. It's the Doggy Moggy Blend. Yeah, that's right. This is beef and chicken. A 40-pound box of raw pet food is going to be on sale right now, 20% off their regular price if you use the discount code BC. 2023. Uh, that's right. BC 2023. It's going to knock off about 20 bucks off the price. It goes from 92 bucks down to 73.50. Orders placed all the way through to February 28th. They're eligible for the discount, and there's no limit. So, I mean, if you've got more freezer space, why not load up right now? Uh, of course, there's delivery available as well. If you're in Edmonton, Calgary, Central Alberta, we have our Grand Dog Essentials quality raw food delivered to our door every week. It couldn't be more convenient. That promo code on the Doggy Moggy blend is BC2023. 
2023. A big shout out as well to our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. They're getting ready for Valentine's Day. They want to make you look good at the Dairy Queens in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and in Sherwood Park on Baseline Road. The Triple Truffle Blizzard Cake will wow your loved ones to say the least. Why not start your Valentine's Day celebration with this legendary combo, peanut butter, fudge, caramel filled truffles. It's a shareable triple truffle blizzard cupid cake. And you can order those, pick them up. We recommend ordering in advance, but you don't have to at the Dairy Queens in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. And very cool to run into the team from Apex Automation last night. More on that, our bourbon tasting a little bit later on in the show. But I was telling Adam, uh, of course, he's the founder of the company, how much I love their new website. They've just redesigned it. If you're a professional engineer looking for a change, you want to infuse a little energy, you want to feel more appreciated, maybe you're not challenged in your current role, their brand new website you'll see right off the hop they are hiring. Go to apexautomation.ca. You can learn more about the career opportunities that are there. They're going to have people applying uh, literally all around the world. I mean, they provide sponsorship for people to come work in Canada. And they've got skilled professional engineers and, and technologists moving from across the country. Uh, they've got field offices in Alberta, BC, Saskatchewan, down in the States. I mean, this company is growing like you wouldn't believe. Giving people back their time mastering the art of automation at apexautomation.ca. Our roundtable today, our Real Talk roundtable, celebrates Black History Month. And we wanted to connect with storytellers. We wanted to connect with talented people who hone their craft and present messages, fiction, nonfiction, to audiences around the world. I'm super excited to welcome Nazanin uh, Knight, a uh, Canadian woman of Caribbean and Middle Eastern descent. Her nuanced stories reflect the uniqueness of her heritage as well as her international life. She's the founder and CEO of 1844 Studios Incorporated, her vision for this company, one that produces thought-provoking and transformative content resonating with a global audience. Jesse Lipscomb is an author, a producer, an actor. He has just released a brand new book, Jars, that I know we're going to have a chance to talk about today. I'm grateful that the both of you have agreed to join us this morning. Welcome to Real Talk. Uh, Nazanin, am I pronouncing your name okay? We didn't have a chance to grab a coffee before we did this. I want to make sure I get it right. It's very close. It's Nazanin. Nazanin. Thank you for the correction. You're making your Real Talk debut today. Why don't you tell us about 1844 Studios? Yes, I am. Thank you for having me on, Ryan. Uh, 1844 Studios is a film production company based in Edmonton, Alberta, uh, and we look to champion diversity in front of and behind camera and as well through our research projects. How does Black History Month fit into your vision as a, as a producer and as a filmmaker? Well, I think, you know, first of all, our content really highlights the oneness of humanity. Um, and it, it gives a chance for, for talent to see themselves reflected in front of the screen. And we want to give Canadian audiences the chance to see their stories in media. And, and they haven't had the opportunity to do that in the way that, that now is happening. So that's what 1844 Studios' mission is. And uh, some of our projects really reflect that fact. People can check out 1844studios.com for more, and we'll we'll get into some of your projects. And I'm I'm looking forward to hearing some of the the backstories there, as 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 well as some of the factors that have certainly fueled your creativity. Jesse, welcome back. It's nice to see your face. Uh, tell us about Jars. This is exciting for you. The, this book literally like just out. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, very exciting. I, I mean, you know, it's my first book that's been published. I'm working on my second right now. But this book, um, for me, is special because uh, my children are often asking, you know, why aren't there stories necessarily that uh, about people who look like me uh, in some of the work that I do? You know, I work with a lot of of the intersections. Um, so whether it's neurodivergent individuals, uh, whether it's the LGBT2 plus individuals, uh, you know, non-binary individuals, this is what this book is. So I have a mixed race, non-binary, 
neurodivergent recluse with superpowers that, you know, discovers things about themselves, mental health, and of course, saving the world and the origins of humanity, all from a super black lens. It's really fun. I think it's important. Uh, and uh, it's exciting to sometimes center stories that aren't often centered. I know Nazanin would probably be on the same page. By the way, kudos. I was looking everything up about you. It is so awesome. I love all the stories, the show you did on the, the Baha'i faith, and you write so much. Sorry, Ryan. I'm like, no, I go for this. Is the point before. of the round table? This is the point. Yeah, I mean, because I've been producing in Edmonton for so long, like for a long time. I've been EPing here and not and just seeing what's been coming up after I left is so amazing. And off the, the live stuff, we should chat. This is very cool. Oh, look at definitely, this. Bring definitely. Bring in bringing creators and storytellers <laughs> together. Nazni, you want to respond to that? You want to tell them a little bit about it? Oh man, I can see a collaboration coming up, Jesse. Definitely reach out to me after this. Uh, Nazanin, how does stuff get on your radar with, with regards to the films, whether whether they're shorts or maybe it'll be feature length projects or whatever 1844 decides to take on? Um, what, what, what are the boxes uh, that have to be ticked? Like, what is it that captures your attention and then and then, you know, prompts you to, to channel your talents toward that specific project? Oh, man, that's a great question. Um, well, you know, I come from a Baha'i background. Uh, that's that's my religious background. And uh, the Baha'i faith sort of encapsulates all of these amazing concepts um, that I wanted to reflect in front of the screen. At the basis of it is the oneness of humanity. But trickling off from that is the elimination of prejudices of all kinds, the equality of men and women, the need for universal education, and so on and so forth. And so when I take on a new project, I really wanted to reflect my values and beliefs. And, and that's really what we've been looking for at 1844 Studios. Mm. Jesse, for you, 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 you talk about your, your kids and your mm -hmm. kids, you know, obviously a priority for them. Man, we could talk for an hour about how important it is for people to see themselves represented. Uh, we just, mm -hmm. I think it was just, it, what was it called? International Day of Women and Girls in Sport. That, that's one example. We talk about women or people of color in politics. We talk about that all the time. It, we talk about women in boardrooms. That was our roundtable a week ago. Uh, it, there, there are so many different contexts and, and applications of that premise of how important it is for people to see themselves represented when you were growing up as a boy as a young man as an adolescent did you see yourself represented in the areas that, that you aspired to achieve you know this is a this is a double-edged question uh because I was actually thinking a lot about this yesterday just um and I, I was thinking about the fact that you know I did and I didn't the thing is growing up there wasn't a lot of options uh for people who look like me and uh and unfortunately if you're not telling your own stories other people uh, are telling them for you. And when other people are telling your stories for you, they become your story, not even on purpose. So for me, looking around, you know, I saw athletes, I saw, um, you know, rappers, uh, but then I also saw, you know, criminals, and I also saw um, the stereotypical roles that existed everywhere and the sens sensationalization of them too. So even when I'm thinking about like hip hop culture and rap culture growing up, it was cool. It was super cool. But what came with it was, it was just such a small, um like snapshot of what black people can be i didn't see black neurobiologists and black teachers and black politicians and black writers and black journalists that that i didn't see so my options were super small so did it influence who i was yeah you know i'm an, i was a pro, i'm a pro athlete and i'm an entertainer uh would i have been had i seen all those other things who knows am i happy that i am those for sure. But then I'm thinking about how important it is. And I didn't hear about these stories till much later. I didn't know who Robert Smalls was. I didn't know who Mansa Musa was. We talk about Elon Musk and Bill Gates. I didn't know about the richest person ever to ever walk the, the earth. I didn't know about John Ware. And, you know, I didn't know about my own auntie until a little bit later, Bessie Coleman, the first black woman to fly an airplane to have an international pilot's license. The fictional stories like Black Panther and Woman King, they weren't around. So yes and no, uh, but I'm happy that now I'm in a position to tell stories, both fictional and real, that can influence those that come after so they can have more than four options of what is available for them in this planet. Huh. I love that answer. And and I guarantee that like a lot of people that are listening to this podcast, you can check it, we're like scribbling down a lot of these names. Like we've we've heard of like John Ware and we've heard of something, but I guarantee you're putting names on people's radar, uh, mm -hmm. which is was one of the great benefits of a conversation like this. Nazanin, just just about well, no less than a month ago, you published uh, a report. I'm really fascinated 
fascinating. People can check it out at telefilm.ca. And I want to ask you about this in just a second, uh, building inclusive networks in the film and television industry. Let's get into that at a high level in a second. But, but on a personal level, for you as a creator, as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, did you see yourself represented growing up? Who, who are early inspirations for you in that context? Gosh, there were so few of them <clears throat> growing up. And I think especially, you know, in the children's space, there's so few, uh, you know, women of color um, portrayed in, in, in less than a stereotypical light uh, in the media. And so, you know, what when I when I started out in film and TV, I really wanted to change that, um, not just showing these tropes of, you know, the angry black woman or, you know, the things that we always see on TV, but full rich characters and you know one of the projects that that we're working on for example it shows a biracial band nerd uh, who excels in high school and you know that's that's who I I was when I was growing up and I never got the chance to see something like that on TV so yeah as there were so few I think role models that I saw in the media who looked like me and sounded like me and were was interested in the same sort of stuff that I'm interested in. Mm. So why don't we get into the, to this paper and people can check it out for themselves. If you just Google or go to telefilm.ca, you'll find it. Just Google building inclusive networks in, in the film and television industry. Where does that start? I mean, is it, is it, is it happening now? Are you experiencing it? You're obviously a driving force behind it. I should mention you're the project lead on this. You're the author of the report. Can you take us into it? Yeah, you know, that that report really started out from personal experience and the experience of, of other women of color uh, with whom I got to chat before writing this report. When I went to industry networking events, I was often the only woman of color in the room. And I wanted to understand why. I wanted to do a deep dive and understand what are some of the barriers um, that uh, prohibit women of color from attending industry networking events because we talk about the film and television industry as a networking business and who you know in the industry really affects the trajectory of your career. So if there are not enough women of color in the room, um, how are they gonna get hired further down the line? How are they gonna get the platform to tell their stories? And so we wanted to take it all the way back and look at uh, what are the barriers affecting um, inclusivity at uh, industry networking events? And actually what we did at the end of the report is we created a checklist that industry organizations could use to ensure that their events are more inclusive to BIPOC women. Uh by the way, most people hear this on the podcast, but I just I feel like your background right now, it looks to me like are you are you in, I've, there's all these black binders on shelves and I'm, my mind is telling, are those scripts and like projects that are working? There's an award over your shoulder there. What's that? Tell us about where you're at right now. I, I love this kind of stuff. These are all projects, believe it or not. These are all uh, scripts, but also research projects. Um, and uh, I just. Even though I don't refer to them as often, I just have them there as a reminder of how much stuff is going on uh, in the life of 1844 Studios. Um, and we're constantly generating new content and content that champions diversity. And, and it's really important um, to generate your own IP as, as a Black creator. Um, because, you know, those are the authentic stories that will be um, portrayed in front in the media. Um, so, I, you know, I think there's not enough black IP um, generated um, by the actual community. And that needs to change. Jesse, you're nodding. Is that resonating with you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was it's actually the reason I ended up becoming a producer. I mean, so I used to produce with uh, Mosaic Entertainment in Edmonton uh, years ago. And uh, but one of the big reasons too. I mean, living in Alberta at the time. Now I live uh, part time Vancouver, part time in Edmonton. But you know, as an actor, there weren't a lot of roles that were created for you. And if they were created for you, uh, uh, you know, it's much later down the the cast line. So you know, you're you're a day player. You might be that cast number twenty four, um, which basically means you're there for a day or two, and your character doesn't really hold the weight of a real story or a real person. But it's work, and you take it. 
Um, but you know, the major roles just they were they were already taken, and the stories weren't really stories that depicted you. And I was going to say, you know, most of the stories, you know, Edmonton, Alberta, Calgary, often Western and often cowboy. But even that isn't accurate because if we're really talking about cowboys. We know why they're called cowboys. If we don't, because cowboys originally were black. That's why they're called cowboys. I see nothing about a horse because we weren't allowed to be on the horses. So they're like, hey, cowboy, you can you can you can go touch the horse, cowboy. But then they were really good at rodeos. And so everyone's like, well, I want to see the cowboys. And so that name stuck, um, you know, or appropriated, whatever you want to call Dude, it. Dude, I grew up in Calgary and I've been to 35 Calgary Stampedes and I just learned that today. I just learned that <laughs> right now. I'm embarrassed about that. If you think about it, like, right, like, why are we calling it cowboy? If anyone didn't really think, there's no cow, and those are grown men. But, you know, you often would call a black man a boy, and then they were allowed to touch cows, not horses. Nonetheless, they still didn't write a lot of roles that looked like me for cowboys uh, and things like that. So then, yes, of course, I started to write my own content. I started to produce with other like-minded individuals. And that idea of writing your own stories and creating your own stories is so important. But also, it's important... Because you got to understand that my, this is what I was talking about yesterday. As a black man, that doesn't mean I'm preloaded with all the black facts. So I am still mm. uh, at the same risk of telling the wrong story if I haven't been, if I haven't learned, if I haven't, if I haven't done my due diligence to figure out what actually occurred. So just because I'm black doesn't mean I'm doing the best black stories. It's that idea of we have to make sure that there's enough real information out there so that can like facilitate and trickle down. So the stories are really authentic and real versions of real black people and black stories. Wow. Uh, can Nazanin, can you talk to us about Shades of Worth? Uh, l- let me tee this up. This is uh, so. There's an event coming up uh, later this month that we want to make sure that people know about uh, in in commemoration of or in celebration of of Black History Month, and that's the Local Heroes Film Festival. And and we're going to make sure that we have all of the information in the the show notes, so you can scroll down into the podcast description or on YouTube as well. Uh, but this is going to be screaming screening at the ECF ESFF Black History Month event. Um, tell us about Shades of Worth. Well, Shades of Worth, you know, it started when uh, I wanted to create content that was uh, game changing in the way that black women are portrayed in the media. Uh, I wanted to highlight their power. I wanted to highlight uh, their maneuverability. I wanted to highlight their beauty and aesthetics in a way that um, that the media doesn't portray. And so Shades of Worth started off as a series uh, of short films and PSAs, uh, like the one on the screen here, uh, and and we we wanted to uh, e- work with local black actresses um, to tell their stories in a way that was authentic, that was powerful, that was visually striking. And so Shades of Worth will be played uh, at the Black History Month screening at ESFF, but you can also check out Power Moves online on our website very cool and, and again that's 1844 studios uh, com, right um and again pe- right. people can link to that I- in the notes as well jesse you want to talk about can, can we get into not that funny because yeah, I, I think this yeah. is super cool people people can find it online at not that funny dot store it's the tabletop game designed to change the world one awkward conversation at a time how did this come about uh, yeah, I mean, so, you know, a little bit of an offshoot from Make It Awkward, yeah. you know, uh, doing a lot of the work, going into different schools, having conversations online and in real life. Why don't we, and- hey, let me interrupt you, because we, we, we haven't teed that up, and I don't want to take for granted that everybody's going to know what, what Make It Awkward was all about. Do you want to kind of give us the background story? This was something that made national news. Yeah, 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 yeah. So 2000, I think 2016, many years ago, I was a uh, uh, a black actor uh, just on the street filming a commercial about how wonderful our Edmonton downtown was. A car pulled up and started screaming racial slurs at me uh, through the window. I walked over to the car and asked them why they did it. We were recording because we were shooting the commercial. They continued to say the same thing, spit off, said it one more time. Uh, and then we had this video and we shared the video uh, just to get a conversation going. And that conversation caught on. And it became more of a national conversation, international conversation. Uh, And it was a conversation more about 
the fact that this happens every day to so many people uh but at the same time the fact that uh it's not it's not just a black and white thing this was happening to all of the different intersections it happens to anybody who's a visible minority uh and what do we do about this how do we how do we stand up for our fellow Edmontonian fellow Canadian how do we have the proper tools to become everyday activists and so make it awkward really became something that was focused on providing tools information to individuals schools businesses so that they can you know level their game up and become um you know on the the right I don't the right side of history or, or but more than that and more like just being able to step into situations and know and feel confident that they can say the right thing maybe make a difference or understand that making mistakes is okay as long as we're moving uh, a little bit better tomorrow than we were today. Um, and so with that, you know, this idea, uh, um, my business partner, Chelsea Bree and myself were chatting about creating a different way to help people get those tools. And so we decided to create a tabletop game, like the gamification of activism, essentially where, you know, we provide some of these real life uh, difficult situations. And then uh, the players have cards of pre-made cards of different expressions that you could say to somebody if they were to say, you know, let's say, you know, somebody said, look, I'm on the lowest rung of the totem pole, something like that, where folks don't know that that's actually uh, an inappropriate thing to say or not that funny. Then you get points for deciding if you can say why it's not that funny. Uh, and you also get points that plays a little bit like Cards Against Humanity in yeah. the sense that you kind of want to play a card that you think the reader is going to get. And here's the cool part, Ryan. It doesn't matter if you get this game because you just want to uh, make fun of situations. You can't not you can't win unless you learn. So this is the fun part. You could have a drunk party with friends and be like, oh, these are hilarious. But literally the score will be zero, zero, zero unless you actually say something correct. And you will learn no matter what your intent is with the game. And it's a pretty fun one. What if people told you, like, uh, let me ask, uh, this This might be a weird question, but I know that neither of you are afraid of having a real conversation. There's, you know, we, we talk about people can get exhausted of certain things. And and I, I had mm. an interesting interesting conversation with a friend a couple of weeks ago. He was coming from a good place. He was coming from a sincere place. And he'd just been called out for something that he said. I know he meant no harm. He got defensive about it. And it prompted a, a, a good conversation with people in a closed off the record private circumstance people that trust each other but he right. indicated that he is exhausted by yeah, all yeah. of this and it, it, how does the game fit into this and and if you picked up on that climate a little bit you know what i'm asking oh, you do yeah i fully know what you're asking a uh the game is is the, one of the reasons is why is because it is oftentimes exhausting to hear the same messages in the same way uh, especially in our pandemic world, like it's Zoom camera, someone's talking to you about what you're doing wrong and how come everything's been bad for you. And I get it why people are exhausted. For sure. It's exhausting. It's by the way, it's been pretty exhausting my whole life. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, but also, yeah. But, but here's the thing, just because it's been exhausting my whole life, it's like this. My wife is runs a marathon. She runs a marathon. Just qualified for Boston Marathon. Way to go, Jules. What, what? But here's the thing. Right. So she can run a marathon. Uh, good for her. Uh, it's exhausting. Yeah. But if I tried it right now, I feel like I'm going to die. I couldn't <laughs> do two kilometers because it's new for me. So like my level of exhaustion is going to be way higher than hers, even though she's doing way more. So I feel like there's a lot of like white men and white people out there that are exhausted. Like I'm exhausted trying to learn a marathon. I just started. Mm. So yeah, it hurts a ton. It's a bunch. I fully get it. And I think it matters. Like, yeah, you have to train and maybe you've got to, it takes a bit. I can't expect you to qualify for Boston today, but I, but I can expect you to let's train a couple times a week so we can get better. So it doesn't hurt like it did before. So yeah, I hear you. I empathize with your exhaustion. Uh, I'm better at marathons than you, uh, but you can train and we can be on the same team one day. Yeah, buddy. I couldn't run 200 meters right now, <laughs> let alone 2k, let alone, hey, you tell Julia, congratulations. That is a will, huge achievement. Well, what's your marathon time? Is she like, what do you have to be to qualify for Boston? Oh man, I'm gonna probably say it wrong. I think she had to run one. Uh, well, one. No, I'm already wrong. That's her half marathon. Fast. Okay, okay. fast, fast. I love it, <laughs> Nazanin. When you talk, like when we're when we're talking about, uh, you know, the how you evaluate, um, and and the word success is such. A, it could be interpreted in so many different ways, right? Like you know, success for a filmmaker. There could be like commercial success, obviously, and and you you know you've got your yacht, uh, you know, in Ibiza, and you know you're, there there's that commercial success or the success of a story being 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 wonderfully told, someone's story who was never told before that now sees the light of day. How do you gauge a successful project? Mm -hmm. I think in, in two ways. Uh, one is when I see the audience reaction. I mean, w when we screen a film at a festival and you have uh, women of color coming to you afterwards and they and they say they want to be doing the same thing that 
that you're doing, even if you impact one person, that's a success to me. You've done your job as a filmmaker. Um, but on, on the other hand, we're very systematic in our work. Uh, and, and we have, you know, sort of cycle documents that we use to track and measure our our tasks for a cycle and, and our goals for the cycle. And so it's very easy in that way to measure our success, to read our reality, to set our goals for the next cycle. Um, because, you know, this industry has so many ups and downs. But if you're achieving what you set out to do for the cycle, at the end of the day, when you come to reflect on your work, uh, I think you can feel proud of what, what you've done. And so as a team, we do that every cycle. We gather together, we say prayers, uh, and we, we look at what we've accomplished in terms of the goals that we set out. Hmm. It's it's intimidating talking to the two of you because you you have your hands involved in so many projects. Your your creative talents are being applied to so many different things. I fear that I'm going to miss talking about something. So if I'm forgetting anything, please be bold and just throw it out there. Uh, Nazanin, I know you've got something coming up in March, uh, and this it looks to be a really neat program. And you've brought on some pretty significant collaborators. Um, can you tell us about B Collective? Yeah, B Collective. Uh, came about actually very organically uh, through a lot of the sets that we ran uh, and wanting to see more BIPOC crew behind camera. Um, and, uh, and so what we did was we had always sort of used out of pocket uh, funding and brought on uh, mentees to work alongside uh, established industry professionals. And we've been doing this for years. But finally, in 2022, we formalized it into something called Be Collective. And we got the support of Alberta Labor, Alberta Culture, organizations like FAVA and the ESIO uh, to really help us formalize this effort. And so uh, last year, we had a set with over 20 BIPOC trainees uh, coming onto set, getting hands-on experience. And now coming up in March, we're following up on that initiative and we're having uh, those same BIPOC trainees and a little bit more uh, come together in a networking event and really get a chance to ask industry stakeholders how they can get more involved, uh, how can they uh, elevate their career, take it to the next level, find more work. And what we're doing is we're really expanding those social networks so that they include more BIPOC folks. Um, and at the end of the day, this benefits everybody. It benefits the Alberta film industry in terms of its sustainability of mm -hmm. new talent, but it also uh, increases the inclusivity of our storytelling as a whole. So that's what our event in March uh, at FAVA, uh, March 25th, is all about. You're getting applause from Lipscomb, as you can see uh, there. People can check out 1844studios.com. Jesse, I, I, I'm sure you, you got to be working on something else that I'm forgetting about. We, we, you know, you know what, Ryan? Yeah, there's lots, but I actually don't even want to do that right now. OK, I don't, I don't. I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to I want to rewind a second because what I don't know if what Nazanin said <clears throat> hit with everybody. I've been on so many sets before. I've been doing film and TV since 1996. Um, and I think maybe the most I've ever seen on a set was maybe four or five. BIPOC individuals and Nazanin just said she had she got 25 BIPOC trainees on one set which is unbelievable that is so cool so kudos to you on that uh, and what you're doing and I will take whatever is happening my way spotlight wise and I'd like to point it there go check out <laughs> Be Collective I've been doing this for like 30 years a long 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 time right so I will find a way to get stuff out there you saw my book sure if you want to read it I'm proud of it I'd love you to get it but other than that Look, I'm not sharing anything else. I'm focusing everything over there and I'm emailing you after this because I have so many cool ideas I want to learn and work together. Oh, thank you, Jesse. Yeah, we would love to work with you and please come to our networking event too. We would love to have you there. Right on. Are you in, Jesse, are you in Vancouver right now? Or are you in Edmonton right now? I'm in, I'm in Edmonton ah. till Sunday. Uh, and then I, I leave on Sunday and then I'll be back. But I mean, for the right event, Flair, it's 49 bucks. Well, I was, and I was going to say, I blew it because we I didn't know, had him in studio. I, I was just going to say, we should have had these two in studio. But Jesse, I thought you were in Vancouver. I blew Bye. it. 
You blew it. That's oh. okay. That means we'll, we'll come back. We'll do it again. No, we'll listen. Again. I'm putting you both on the record. This is a verbal contract. As soon as as soon as you two collaborate on something, absolutely come on here and join me in the studio. I blew it. I thought you were in Van City, uh, and we'll uh-huh. and we'll get you here in studio. I can't I can't wait for that. That's going to okay. be fantastic. This is this is 15 second 15 second bit because uh, now that we're going to do that, I'm going to put this out there on live. Um, so the book that I'm doing, yeah. I need, I, I want to, the whole point is it's a film and it's, there's three films, right? So I need to find the proper production company to take that IP. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about. And I would love this to be the egg, the seed. And then like in a year, we're like, yes, we're in pre-production of jars, the feature. Um, so we'll talk about the details, but this is the whole point of the project. So this oh, is man. This is great. All right. Yeah. Perfect. Thumbs up. Every, I'm smiling so big. My face is hurting. Uh, I knew that the two of you together were good. I didn't know that this was going to happen, but I knew that we were getting two dynamic storytellers on here and it's impossible. Um, the enthusiasm is like palpable right now. Uh, we oftentimes will wrap our Friday uh, roundtables with with giving the audience a charge, you know, as they say, like something to think about, something to walk with, something to focus on. Now, of course, the overarching theme here is a celebration and recognition of black history month but please feel free whatever you feel led whatever you feel compelled to put in front of this audience uh, Nazanin maybe we'll start with you what's what's something that you'd like our audience to think about over the next few days to think about over the next few days I think uh definitely looking into how you can play your part in championing the storytellers from underrepresented groups and in particular from from BIPOC communities, whether that be going to a festival uh, where where Black films are spotlighted or uh, reading a local uh, Black artist uh, and, and, and really looking at, at how you can elevate their content and infuse it into the social discourses of society. I love it. Jesse? Yeah, I'm going to jump on the very similar page. This is a Black Storytellers Roundtable. So, uh, but I'm going to go really specific because I'm not even going to beat around the bush. It's called Pay Money for Local Black Storytellers Content. Go find who they are, buy their things. Because the cool thing is the more you buy of their things, the more relevant they become. And then they can do more and they can affect more. And it takes a full community. Uh, and as much as we want to say we support, sometimes it's literally just a couple thumbs. And you've done so much. Or write a review. Write a review on Amazon for some content, um, even if you haven't read it. Because you can do that. So make it really nice. Okay, that's all. All right, I love it. Jesse's new book is called Jars. It's uh, published by Friesen Press. And you can order it by following the link in our show description. You can learn more about what Nazanin is doing uh, her remarkable work at 1844studios.com. Uh, what a wonderful conversation. I'm so grateful that Nazanin Knight and Jesse Lipscomb uh, made time to talk with us this morning on Real Talk. Much love to you both. Mad respect. Thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Look at that. I know that they're going to collaborate on something. I, I Something tells me that they're going to wait like five minutes before they start talking about their next project. That, you get that sense. The end of a busy week. We we missed the mark there. We should have had them here. <laughs> I, well, he, he moved to Vancouver I know, like I a few years ago, yeah. and I just figured he was there. It didn't even occur to me. I, I could have to, now, that, now, that we're, now that we've got our studio set up, and now that we're settled in, and, and everything's covered, we've got to, I've, I've got to make that like question number one now. You know, Are you going to be joining us here in studio? We've got some cool stuff coming down the pike with regards to in-studio studio interviews but i don't want to jinx it i don't want to blow it i'll just say that you know for example off the top of my head you know the the junos are going to be in our home city of edmonton next month Mm -hmm. maybe we'll have to do something about that johnny i don't know maybe that's something that that we could start working on wink wink nudge nudge you know i think that that's going to be pretty cool we got some cool stuff coming the junos are across the street Literally across the street. So we're going to be involved in some way. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Looking forward to that. These conversations happen because of sponsors like our friends at Kubi Renewable Energy. If you're thinking of going green this year, Trash Talk's coming up in just a second, by the way. Nobody has the reputation. Nobody has the infrastructure, staffing, experience, and otherwise that Kubi does. You know, according to figures from the government of Alberta, you know, basically, when you want to talk about how much carbon could your solar energy system offset, in plain language, a solar power system that generates 10,000 kilowatt hours per year will save over 170 tons of carbon over its lifetime. 
your household could achieve that. You want to talk about lessening your footprint? That could start right now at kubienergy.ca. Go ahead and get your free quote and learn more about this interest-free loan that's available from the feds. You can pay this thing off over 10 years with 0% interest. You're not getting that rate on any other loan right now. That's a fact. Now, did you know that you can actually sell those carbon credits and actually make money? Kubi Energy can facilitate all of that for you. And a big part of that is their partnership with Yup, Park Power, your friendly local utilities provider. Uh, they do electricity, natural gas, internet, and famously, they'll pay you more for your excess power than any of the big guys. It just makes sense to take your business to Park Power, let alone the fact that a portion of their proceeds are donated to nonprofits in the communities where they live and work. Never mind the fact that that the brand new promo code REALTALK23 could save you up to $150 off your first bill if you bundle electricity, natural gas, and internet. You can compare rates today at parkpower.ca. It's a big weekend coming up at Friesen Brothers. I know because a lot of people are going to be placing their orders for their sweet and savory charcuterie boxes. If you're looking to wow your Valentine, why not trust Friesen Brothers with this beautiful charcuterie spread? You can order your your custom charcuterie box today and pick it up in store more than 15 as a matter of fact 16 alberta locations this company founded more than 65 years ago still family owned friesen brothers is alberta grown and alberta owned we're proud to partner with friesen brothers if you're looking to transform your landscape if you're looking to improve the quality of the backyard the front yard, wherever it is that you're spending most of your time coming up this spring into this summer, it's never too early to reach out to the team at Eden Landscaping. A family-owned business, Mike has been running the show for more than 20 years, earning the return business and the referrals of many, many clients. You can check out their portfolio and their services at landscapeedmonton.ca and learn more about the mantra. Learn more about what makes them tick. Learn more about their philosophy, an exceptional landscape, a thoughtful, flowing vision. It marries the client's wishes to a coherent artistic direction that not only stands up over time, but also lends itself to enjoyment and function as the landscape matures. Nobody does it quite like Eden Landscaping. You can work with them starting with a visit to landscapeedmonton.ca. Boy, did we have fun last night at Whiskey Drop. This was a, a special event that we were really proud to present as a, as a benefit, as a thank you uh, to Real Talk's Patreon supporters. And so it was our official Real Talk cask number two bourbon launch at Whiskey Drop. And we had a wonderful time. Travis Watt, the founder of PWS Imports, kind of took the reins of the evening. And as you can see, a, a room of about 25 whiskey aficionados that had a chance to check out the, the Real Talk Old Fashioned Johnny. We made that with the uh, the Real Talk Maple Bourbon, a nice candied orange and a, and a beautiful whiskey-soaked cherry in there. And then we ran the gamut of, of other offerings from the Broken Barrel Whiskey Company. That's the distiller that did ours for us out of California, a very unique style they have and then we tested uh, some scotches as well we kind of kind of kind of ran the gamut we, we covered the spectrum of different types of whiskeys with different stories and different origins and wow was it ever a lot of fun everybody learned something regardless of your level of understanding of what a whiskey is or what makes a good whiskey i will say we blew out a bunch of bottles of the Real Talk bourbon last night, but there still are a few left. This is a limited run, an extremely limited release. If you want to check out our Real Talk maple bourbon, you can order yours today at whiskeydrop.ca. You go to the website. It's easy to find. You click on the search link. You type in Real Talk, and right away, you'll see it pop up. There it is, the bottle, the Real Talk cask number two. Uh, distilled by the team at Broken Barrel, uh, an absolutely fantastic turnout last night. We thank everybody for being there. If you want to learn more about supporting Real Talk on Patreon and some of the perks that come along with that, you can always visit our website, ryanjesperson.com. Just click on Connect. 
Now, every Friday, thanks to our friends at Local Environmental Services, we give you a chance to to blow off some steam. You can see more about what they do at localenvironmental.ca. It's a tradition that essentially shines the light on emails, real emails that are sent to our address at talk at ryanjesperson.com. Fittingly, we call it Trash Talk! Yeah, this one from Larry who says, Jess, boy, I heard both you and Johnny say on Thursday that issues that just aren't that sexy that seem not to be important to the general public. Yes, sex sells. We know that, you know, even before the first release of Playboy back in 1953, before TV was invented, before the Internet. Now a dominant requirement, right? It seems to be the essential focus of all social media platforms. Sex and selling to try to fully grasp the impact of sexy on our children and teens and families and society and culture and planet Earth is well beyond the capabilities of any person, company, organization, government, culture. Even AI has limited capacity to understand sexiness. He says, now glossing through news feeds, this topic, in particular the aspect of sexy, it seemed to me that something deserved discussion. With healthcare services in Alberta or across the country experiencing a never-before-seen crisis due to an incredible range of causes, American-style privatization of health services wanting to dominate, to displace a cornerstone, the foundational right that Canadians share, the surrender to this sex gluttony. He says, I've grown up constantly reminded, remembering the advice, always live within your means. It's been a simple and sound tidbit that seems to have been replaced now with go big, go sexy, go gluttonous as some sort of life mantra. If Canada is broken, if societies are at a crossroads, I blame gluttony and sex selling at the heart. If not us now, then who? If not us now, then when? He says, I appreciate Real Talk, but I'm not a big fan of sexy being a criteria for any fucking thing in this day and age. Peace and slava Ukraine. That from Larry. I love it. How about this one from Bradley who says, Jespo, great shows this week. Uh, I've been hearing this story about our star, that $20 billion giveaway. I'm always on the side of a clean planet and good jobs. But this story is the same as what indigenous people have been saying for a long time. Companies making a promise, and then when the deal's ending, the government seemed to kind of help them out to get out of a promised agreement. If there ever was a time for people of all backgrounds in Alberta to come together for the greater good, this is it. A deal is a deal. I worked with an older generation in the oil patch, and they told me how good we had with regards to environmental regulation. They told me the company would bring in equipment and fuel and building materials, but then when the job was done, we would just leave everything on the job site. Equipment was run into the lakes. Fuel was opened up to go into the ground. Are you hearing what this guy's saying right here? And it was all because it was too much of a cost to bring it all out and put it away. What is different right now? Maybe the time. I don't know. He says, are people still doing this? We made all this kind of history already. He says, I think it's time to do the right thing. I think it's time to hold companies and governments accountable. And one way to do that is to get out and vote. He says, anyway, I hope it all works out in the end to the best of all of us to enjoy what we have and to enjoy what we want to keep. That from Brad. That's a serious email. How about this one from Patty, who says, I got a new definition for made. It's medical avoidance in dying. Uh, Patty says, I'm not one to air my personal grievances, uh, let alone on trash talk, but we feel the need to to sort of let you know about our family's personal battle. This really sucks, by the way. Our 85-year-old mother's questioning whether the Alberta government even values her. She's currently waiting for radiation treatment for a reoccurrence of endometrial cancer. Originally diagnosed in 2021, resulted in a complete hysterectomy, uh, hysterectomy done robotically. Fast forward eight months, systems reoccur, pathology confirms the cancer's back. Our mom, who is a healthy, independent 85-year-old, now feels that Alberta Health has determined she is not worthy of the investment to treat her due to her age. The frustration of trying to be her advocate, beyond reasonable. She's already been misdiagnosed once. The longer her treatment is delayed, the more likely she will hit stage three. Family and friends who have tried to seek treatment at the Mayo Clinic have been told, you don't need us. you got two of the best cancer clinics in North America, the Cross and the Tom Baker. That doesn't make an impact if they can't deliver the services desperately needed by Albertans like our mum. The system that all of our fundamental tax paying is going to is broken. Patty says, well, our premier, our health minister, and their teams decide whether or not they want to accept the conditions of the federal funding increase. They need to take a step back and think of where they would be and what they would do if this was their mom. And this one from Marshall, who says, Jespo, 
after watching the absolute sideshow of Alberta's government this week, I just had to submit a trash talk concerning the absolute embarrassment of our so-called premier that made it the province this week. I organized for the Alberta party, says Marshall, a gargantuan task, I understand, make all the jokes you want. Marshall, no jokes. He says nobody in our party supports the absolute joke of a handshake that Daniel Smith pulled off with the Prime Minister of Canada, in all caps. And I would never want to mingle with a party who thinks that is what leadership looks like. Whatever happened to decency? Whatever happened to looking somebody in the eye and shaking their hand as a sign of mutual respect? What would Daniel Smith's grandparents think about this? Making a mockery of herself. It's shit like this that makes the rest of the country think we're a bunch of buffoons. Now say what you will about Trudeau. Make all the heated comments you want. Some of it is fairly deserved, but to me with your Prime Minister and make such a colossal ass of yourself is nothing short of disgusting. I understand the purpose is to rile up the base. I understand it's a cynical act designed to trigger people like me for the sake of Twitter clout. I know I shouldn't let it bother me, but it doesn't make me any less furious to see somebody who claims to represent me and four and a half million other Albertans make such a craven, desperate, flailing, deceitful attempt at holding on to power. Why can't we go back to the good old days when politicians at least pretended to be decent, normal people? Not the petulant asses we see now. It's fucking exhausting! That from Marshall. I hope you feel better, pal. And thanks for sending us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We'll fire it up again next Friday. In the meantime, we'll be working on telling the stories that matter most to you, real talkers. You can help us out by smashing the like button, by sharing our content by subscribing to us on YouTube and the podcast and like Jesse Lipscomb just said leave us a review we're not too embarrassed to ask for that we love it when you do make it a great weekend real talkers and we'll see you right back here on Monday real talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson Executive Producer, Josh Dunford. Technical Producer, John Hicks. General Manager, Katie Cook-Chivers. Account Coordinator, Lawrence Durlego. Human Resources, Lena Shepard. Website Design, Mike Johnston. VoiceOver by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's Editorial Board is Supriya Dubetti, Ahmed Ali, Randy Morin, Anne Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta, on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is a relay project. For more, check out ryanjasperson.com.